This is Anchored in Christ, the sermon podcast that gives you hope in the gospel as an anchor for your soul. Brought to you from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Welcome to another episode of Anchored in Christ, the sermon podcast from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. I'm Deborah Owen, and I'm here with Reverend Dr. Sarah Singleton, our pastor. And we are talking today about um, the, we're, we're in the middle of the sermon series called Soul Searching based on John Ortberg's book, Soul Keeping. And today, actually, Sarah, this is one of the sermons that you weren't planning to preach, but we had a guest preacher, Reverend Larry Jones. Right. Larry Jones is the moderator of the Presbytery of Northern New England. The Presbyterian churches are related to one another through a connectional system. And each year we elect a moderator. And Reverend Larry Jones is jolly. He's Mm -hmm. a scholar. Mm -hmm. He's passionate. I thought he was very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And what he's going to be speaking to us today um, in our sermon is about contentment. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, and, and I, as I read the sermon title and I was listening to the sermon, I thought there was some difference between, you know, or, or some trying to understand the difference between happiness and contentment. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people feel like, oh, if I'm happy, then I'm content or, I, you know, that's enough for life. And yet Paul tells us, as we hear in the sermon um, from Philippians, that there is a difference being content in all circumstances is something that's really um, something that we can aspire to with the help of God. Right, content in all circumstances. Mm-hmm. And so he also used Je- John 15 and Jesus' uh, parable of the v- vine mm-hmm. and we being branches that are connected because there's no way to have a fruit of God with us life um, if we are not connected. So that's mm-hmm. a difference in mm-hmm. that contentment, connection Mm -hmm. versus happiness based on circumstances. That's right. That's great. Well, let's listen to the sermon. It's from Paul's letter to the Philippians. I'm sorry, how can I just start reading without, without saying how wonderful it is to be here, to be sharing in worship with you? There is, of course, 200 years, 250 years of history, almost 300 years of history in this building. But there is also life in this congregation. And there is joy. And my seat companion and I were were talking about the uh, sharing of the peace just now. Every church does a sharing of the peace, but most churches, you shake hands with the person next to you and sit down real quickly. In this church, you shake hands with everybody else in in the church. You are a congregation of the faithful, and it is a pleasure and a joy to be with you to, uh, well, I guess I want to bring, well, I guess I want to bring you greetings from the other 30 churches of the Presbytery and one fellowship. And yesterday at the Presbytery meeting, we had the almost unbelievable joy of welcoming um, a new congregation into the Presbytery. A fellowship of Kenyans who worship in Lowell have been together for a number of years and finally after a number of years and a great deal of prayer and effort they have they're strong enough to become a congregation of the PC USA and so our presbytery today is one church bigger than it was at the dawn of yesterday and it is a privilege to be yes that's worth applause thank you Dan <laughs> Well, we stand in a good tradition in this presbytery because Paul traveled all over the Mediterranean um, preaching, founding churches, and this is um, in a letter, uh, a portion of a letter from the the end of his uh, letter to the Philippians. Listen for the word of God. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, 
I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. May God bless both of our readings to our understanding. And to the name of the Lord and the name of the Lord alone be all glory and praise. Let us pray. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Paul could do all things through the God who strengthens him, strengthened him. How did that strength come to Paul? Who mediated it? Received? What antennae did Paul have up? What roots did he have sunk? Through, which, through what kind of satellite dish did Paul receive the strength that kept him going through any and all circumstances? Yes, he was connected to God. But how was he connected to God? What was his cable? If, as John wrote, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, I think it fair to say that Paul lived his life on the vine. Paul reached out the way grapevines grow, reaching into the far corners of the arbors where he found himself. And soon, other people were growing into faith in Jesus Christ. The branches of the vine were not without problems. Don't think they were for a minute. As blight hits actual vines, so there were problems in Paul's churches. He founded the church in Philippi, the first, his first on European soil, and that congregation was attacked by good Roman citizens for not being patriotic enough, and that congregation was attacked by good Jews for not being Jewish enough. He founded the church in Corinth, and probably the churches in Colossae, Ephesus, and Thessalonica. And I recommend to you the last four chapters of 2 Corinthians to read about a few of the problems that church had. All of them were grounded in Jesus Christ. And all, of course, had many sources of nourishment and support. But certainly the visits by, but certainly the visits by and the correspondence with Paul were major sources of encouragement and nutrition. They also nourished him, of course, and some drained him. But his ongoing relationship with fellow worshipers of Christ gave his life meaning and value, and it certainly kept anything in his life from becoming dull. John Ortberg's book, Soul Keeping, you are, of course, all familiar with. In chapter 8, Ortberg makes the point that our souls cannot be satisfied by external things, by occupation, or success, or fame, or accomplishments, or, or titles. If our souls are not centered in Jesus, satisfy us. Now, Paul knew restlessness. He was constantly anxious over the congregations he had founded. And some of them, like the Corinthians, gave him a great deal of trouble. Furthermore, he seldom knew times of rest. The man traveled constantly. When he was not traveling, he was teaching and preaching. Many times he was imprisoned. Once he was sentenced to die by stoning, and he survived only a, by a group of his friends charging in, surrounding him, taking the hits of the stones themselves, and hustling him out of there. 
When he wasn't doing those things, he was writing, or rather dictating, and you can tell he was dictating by the digressions in which he engaged, which his scribe dutifully jotted down, probably beyond Paul's intent. And in most of his letters, his scribe also appended his own name at the end. But all of these activities and troubles and anxiety were taking place over a deep-seated peace that is really beyond the world's understanding because it does not begin, end, or find its home in the world. Where did Paul find that peace which was evident even in this short passage from Philippians? Let us remain with the metaphor of the grapevine, for it is a vital one in several senses of that word. We think of Paul as a solitary figure, going around the eastern Mediterranean, living here or there, challenging Peter to his face, and really being the single-handed apostle to the in the single-handed apostle to the Gentiles. But that is not a biblical picture of the apostle. All of his letters are written from him and someone else, or from him and several others. He lived in partnership with other believers. After his road to Damascus experience, he stayed with disciples in Damascus for a number of days, being instructed in the faith. After this instruction, he traveled to Jerusalem where he was immediately met with suspicion and rejection. It took a friend, Barnabas, to vouch for him and to describe the conversion experience Paul had had. Paul then met with Peter and James, the Lord's brother, in order to get his vision approved by them. And finally, he spent most of his Christian life raising money for the Jerusalem church all the members of which seem to have given their money away, and we believe Paul was very successful in that endeavor. He was no solitary evangelist. He remained in constant communication with his churches and with other church leaders. Already schooled in Jewish tradition, he became a student of those who came before him in Christianity. Despite some pretty significant differences with some of them, including with James, the brother of the Lord, and despite a falling out with the Alexandrian intellectual Apollos, he continued to work together with all of them for the good of the greater whole. Certain of his own personal experience of the risen Christ, he nevertheless used Scripture extensively to argue that Jesus was the Messiah beyond Jewish expectation. In other words, he valued community and he valued the mind. Paul could do all things through the God who strengthened him. That strength came from the people with whom he associated the many men and women who supported him financially and personally at some significant sacrifice to themselves, and that strength came from his thorough and intimate knowledge of the Scriptures, which was not surprising considering he was a scholar of the law, a Pharisee, before his conversion. He also had had a direct encounter with the risen Christ, an encounter so overwhelming that it turned his life completely around. But one experience does not keep a life turned around. It was the community and the learning he acquired about Christ that kept him on his course. If you would have your life on the vine connected to the source of all life and the only place where you can find peace for your soul, whatever your work, family life, or interests, then do not neglect community and learning. 
Look at your church right here. Look at both the outreach and educational activities you have going on each week. Look at the community activities. Look at the community activities which, well, feed your souls. You as a church are living the lessons both Paul and John Ortberg are teaching. But in a physical sense, you can only be nourished if you actually eat the food you are being offered. In a spiritual sense, you can be part of this wonderful community, but if you do not take part in it, then your soul will be a, like a branch pruned from the vine, alive at first, but withering without nourishment. Now I know that that was a challenge a minister has to be careful to make. After all, a minister is almost totally involved in her or his church, and that can be just as deadening as not taking in the multitude of activities, missions, educational events, and social life which a church sponsors. In the days when I was a church pastor, and still today, I had the good fortune to be married to a woman who, while totally supportive of the church and our ministry together, kept reminding me of my first responsibility to be a husband and father. Members of one congregation I served virtually insisted that I join the Rotary Club, something non-churchy, to get me out of the church doors and involved in the community. At first, I rebelled against this, but it turned out to be life <laughs> and soul saving. You see, everyone is busy. Church for its members is a volunteer activity, and the dealings of one's trade and the necessity of, the necessity of responding affirmatively to one's place of employment often prevents people from involving themselves in the buffet of church activities that could feed the soul. So we opt for the spiritual fast food version of church instead, grabbing the quick bite of soul food when a sit-down banquet is being offered. This is insidious because, like the place under the golden arches and its sibling establishments, we might fill ourselves up, but we're not on the road to real health. Two summers ago, I spent some time in Spain. Do you know how a Spaniard can spot an American a mile off? The American is the one who is eating and walking simultaneously. Sp sit down to eat. A meal is an event, not a simple intake of calories. Or as John Ortberg puts it, hurry is one of the main barriers that keeps me from life on the vine. You have a church here that resembles one three times its size in its activities, outreach, and mission. You are an example to the other 30 churches and one fellowship that make up the Presbytery of Northern New England. On the theory that if you want something done well, you should always give a job to a busy person, do not remain only partially connected to this vine that is so bursting with life. Step away from it occasionally, but be wholly connected to it. Be like the weaned child with its resting in the comfort of loving arms. The nursing child is motivated by need and requires its mother's support to feed. The weaned child is simply giving love and receiving it at the same time. The weaned child, who in the time before bottles and formula would have been two or three years old, was calmed and quiet because it chose to lie with its mother for the sheer comfort of the act. Let your soul rest with this church in the many ways this good congregation has made possible. Ortberg refers to the writings of Brother Lawrence and his practice 
of the presence of God. Brother Lawrence, remember, ran a kitchen in a busy monastery. Free time was not a luxury he enjoyed. So he made use of his busy times. He practiced the presence of God in washing pots and pans, in haggling with vegetable merchants, in planning meals and menus, in organizing kitchen staff. He made it a habit to practice the presence of God in his work, both physical and mental. He let his soul rest with his community in the many ways he was active. Do all things through the God who strengthens you. And if I might quote George Whitfield at the last, come, poor, lost, undone sinner, come just as you are to Christ. Only I, only I add on my own, do not expect to remain as you are. For when you live your life on the vine, you will grow, and your growth will produce fruit, and the fruit you nourish will change the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. If you'd like more information about our historic church, or you'd like to find out more about the gospel of Jesus, please visit our website at oldsouthnbpt.org. The peace of Christ be with you.